into this building. And they are the banners of those 12 incredible explorers that pushed the boundaries of trade and actually planted the seeds of commercial and industrial growth to foster the American dream. That spirit is at the heart of the US Chamber of Commerce, which has been working so hard for more than a century, actually as old as this building is, and as solid as it is. We need to make sure it stays solid going forward. The Chamber and the IMF have actually a lot in common, and it's only fitting that I'm, that I'm coming here this morning to give this preview. We both take an international perspective. We both advocate for greater collaboration between the public and the private sector, between governments and business. And above all, we are deeply committed to promoting jobs, growth, and opportunities for all. So that is the reason why we should discuss here how to make growth more sustainable and inclusive, how to reduce trade tensions, and how to strengthen confidence and, str and trust in the economy and in the institutions. Those are the issues that the ministers of finance and central bank, go central bank governors are going to discuss pretty much the whole of next week, and I apologize in advance for the mess that they will make of the traffic in Washington. They will be confronting an economic landscape that places a premium on the right kind of policy actions. And I would like to quote President Theodore Roosevelt to at least inspire them when they come. There is every reason why we should face the future seriously. Neither hiding from ourselves the gravity of the problems, nor fearing to approach these problems with the unbending, unflinching purpose to solve them aright. Facing the future seriously is certainly something that we all want to do, because as Woody Allen would have said, we intend to spend a lot of time there. So I would like to focus on how we can harness this unbending, unflinching purpose for the benefit of all. Let me begin, first of all, by giving you this um, global economic weather map. A year ago, I told the finance ministers and central bank governors, borrowing from another American president, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, it is when the sun is shining that you have to fix the roof. Six months later, I pointed to clouds of risks on the horizon. And today, if you ask me, the weather is increasingly unsettled. Now, what do I mean by that? In January, the IMF projected global growth for 2019 and 2020 at around 3.5%, which was a downgrade from our previous estimate. And it was certainly less than in the recent past, but still reasonable. It has since lost further momentum, as you will see from our updated forecast that will be released exactly a week from today. So I'm not going to give numbers. Suffice to say that it has lost some momentum. Only two years ago, 75% of the global economy experienced an upswing. So it was a synchronized growth acceleration. For this year, we expect not 75, but 70% 70 of the global economy to experience a slowdown in growth, exactly the opposite of what we had. But just to be clear, we do not see a recession in the near term. In fact, we expect some pickup in growth in the second half of 2019 and into 2020. So you see now what I mean by unsettled. And indeed, the global economy is at a delicate moment. What's happened to global growth? Well, it has been slowing largely because of rising trade tensions and financial tightening in the second half of 2018. At the same time, as we look at it today, global economic activity is set to benefit from the now more patient 
pace of monetary normalization by most central banks, in particular the Fed. But also from increased stimulus, including from China. These policy responses have supported an easing of financial conditions and increased capital flows towards emerging market economies, where currencies, under threat at the end of 2018, are strengthening relative to the US dollars, dollar. But again, to be clear, the expected rebound in global growth later this year and into early 2020 is precarious. Why is that? Because it is vulnerable to downside risks, including country-related uncertainties, such as Brexit, for instance, and broader uncertainties, such as high debt in some sectors, in some countries, tensions around trade policy, still uncertain, and a sense of unease in financial markets. For example, should there be a sharper than expected tightening of financial conditions, it could create serious challenges for many governments and companies around the world in terms of refinancing and debt service, particularly those that have borrowed in non-domestic currencies, which could ampl amplify exchange rate movements and financial market corrections. So, indeed, it is a delicate moment in and of itself, and it requires a delicate mix of policies. In other words, it should be handled with care, which means avoiding policy missteps and making sure that we adopt the right policies. And I see three mutually reinforcing uh, areas of action. In domestic policies, first. In cross-border policies, second. And in coordinated efforts to tackle the major global challenges that we all face, third. And it is the interaction between these three that can constitute that right policy mix. So let me touch on each of those three. First and foremost, policies those that are domestic, must provide conditions at home for people to succeed. Now, I have mentioned John Fitzgerald Kennedy quote, and I have repeated over and over in many countries around the world, please fix the roof, now is the time. That applies particularly to structural reforms. Now, of course, when it comes to structural reforms, many policymakers say, okay, well, what's, what's the recipe? Well, unfortunately, it is going to have to be country-specific, and it, is, it has to be customized to each circumstances. So structural reforms are obviously the best way to fix the roof and to boost productivity and long-term growth. The, the second category of tools that is available when it comes to macroeconomic policy in order to secure growth and stability revolves around what central banks can eventually do. Monetary policy, in our view, should remain accommodative where inflation is below target and should anchor expectations. Exchange rate flexibility, this is a long-standing position of the IMF, should actually be used as needed to help absorb shocks. And the financial sector should be strengthened and risks reduced by maintaining the impetus of the regulatory reforms that have been undertaken over the last few years. The reality of economies is that many of them are not resilient enough. Yes, they have come out of the big, great financial crisis, but some of them are not resilient enough. High public debt and low interest rates have left limited room to act when the next downturn comes, which inevitably it will. So for many countries, this implies doing something that they have not been very good at, actually, but making use of fiscal policy, which in turn means striking the right balance between growth that you want to protect and encourage, debt sustainability that is often at risk, particularly in the low-income countries, and social objectives. I've been, as Thomas mentioned, finance minister for my country, France, 
uh, for over four years, and I know how difficult it is to actually keep those three balls up in the air. But it involves actually building fiscal buffers in good time in order to actually have the fiscal space that will help in bad times. It involves the continual hard work of upgrading tax systems, mobilizing domestic revenue, prioritizing growth-friendly expenditures, and reducing public debt where needed. It also involves addressing excessive inequality, much talked about and clearly probably one of the factors that fuel the frustration and the insatisfaction that has been visible around the world. And here, fiscal policy can play a key role, including through progressive tax measures that would need, of course, to be country-specific. No one size fits all, again. Stronger safety nets that can help address dislocations caused by technological changes as well as globalization. Above all, fiscal policy can help create broader opportunities by providing access to quality education, quality health care, and infrastructure, particularly for those who have been left behind or left out in many countries of the world. And that applies in particular to youth and women. This kind of policy action mix is likely not only to address the macroeconomic circumstances of, country, of countries, but it's also likely to help build confidence and trust and overcome the perception of an unfair sharing of economic benefits. And speaking of perception, let me mention one area where perceptions have been growing in relation to the increasing concentration of market power by a few corporate giants. Now, I know some of you might be represented in the room, so please pay special attention. Really interesting finding, actually. Um, that will be released in the next couple of days. That new analysis shows that over the past two decades, rising corporate market power in advanced economies had only a very limited effect on investment, on output, and on the share of national income paid to workers. All right. However, we also found that a small number of highly dynamic companies accounted for the highest price markups. In other words, there seems to be a winner-takes-most dynamic that is at play, especially pronounced, will not be a surprise to you, in the digital economy. Now, I'm not saying that today we have a special monopoly pro problem that is left unaddressed. But I'm saying that we should take the appropriate measures so that it does not become a problem. That means reducing barriers to entry for new firms and reforming competition frameworks to ensure a level playing field in all sectors of the economy, whether traditional ones or new technologies. So this is what I mean by the domestic policies. Let me turn now to the cross-border policies. And here, there are a wide range of economic issues to be addressed. Upgrading financial regulations. Work underway. Improving debt transparency. Work underway and much more to be done. Tackling illicit financial flows. Underway, much to be done only to name a few. But there is one particular sector that you are all familiar with, which takes it all in terms of level playing field, and that is trade. It's an area where the Chamber and the IMF have much in common. We all know that for many decades, trade integration has helped to increase prosperity reduce poverty, spread new technologies, and boost productivity. We have done a lot of research on all those accounts, and we can say confidently that this is the case. For people around the world, it has produced a lower cost of living and created millions of new jobs with higher wages. But at the same time, we know that not Everyone has benefited, and some have been left out. 
We know that there are distortions in the trade system that needs to be reformed. We also know, and this is also work that we have done, that trade barriers are not the answer. Again, we've done more research on that particular account. It's about to be released in the next couple of days, so I strongly encourage you to have a look at the IMF um, website. It will be available to all. But it shows just how much important it is to avoid policy misstep in this sphere. We have analyzed the experience of 180 countries over the past six decades, and we have found that trade integration clearly and disputedly boosts investment. Investment in plant, in machinery, and many other high job creating areas. Conversely, trade barriers clearly damage investment and employment. Now this finding is of particular relevance now at a time when trade tensions could further damage investment, particularly at a time when investment is clearly already weak. So that's another reason why it's a delicate moment. Specifically, we have looked at what might happen if tariffs on all goods traded between the US and China went up by 25 percentage point, points. That alone, so 25% tariff increase on all goods traded between the US and China. That would entail a reduction of GDP of 0.6% for the United States and 1.5% for China. Do the math. Those are self-inflicted wounds that should be avoided, and hopefully they will be. Yet discussions about trade distortions or unfair practices are often bound up with the concept of bilateral trade deficits and surpluses, as well as tariffs. The fact is that historically, bilateral trade balances have been driven mostly not by tariffs, but by macroeconomic factors. In other words, the most effective way to reduce a bilateral trade deficit is to steer clear of tariffs and to address the macroeconomic situation. Because tariffs on the goods of one country, they don't eliminate trade, they divert trade to other countries. And it is not a bilateral balance that matters, it's the overall trade balance for a country that is important. So as I have said, just like I have said, please fix the roof, nobody wins a trade war. That is why we need to work together to reduce trade barriers and modernize the global trade system so that we all win. That means addressing issues such as state subsidies and how they are apprehended by the WTO addressing intellectual property and how that is respected and rights enforced. That means address, addressing the issues of data privacy, of transfers of technology. It also means new deals to unlock the full potential of tradable services and digital commerce. And it means having rules-based frameworks to ensure fair competition and a level playing field. So as we move forward, we need collective action to modernize the key functions of the world trade organizations, from negotiation to transparency to dispute resolu resolution and everything in between. This will create a stronger and more flexible system at the same time. Now, leveling the, play the playing field is not just about trade. And you may have read in some morning orange papers recently, that we are also concerned about international taxation and particularly corporate tax. I have gone so far as to, stay, as to say that the system is fundamentally out of date. And I believe that we share with the chambers the view that it is counterproductive for countries to take a unilateral approach. We need a cross-border effort 
Reforming international corporate taxation is a challenge for all countries. But developing economies rely especially on corporate tax revenue to fund essential investments in people and infrastructure. And based on the work that we have just completed, which will be released in the next few days, or has been released already last week actually, non-OECD countries lose out every year $200 billion because companies are able to shift profits from one place to the other, often obviously choosing the low tax locations. There's nothing wrong with being tax smart, but the corporate international tax system has to be updated. Because this foregone revenue for the low-income countries in particular is not there to help them reach the goals of the sustainable development goals that were set out for 2030, to invest in health and education and hospitals and roads. Now, the good news is that efforts to modernize the international corporate tax system is underway, but there is a lot more than can be done, that can be done. And the IMF is certainly suggesting a few options that need to be explored uh, together. So I have so far talked about the domestic priorities and the cross-border priorities, picking and choosing trade and tax as two examples where that can happen. Let me now turn to the third priority, which I will not go into great details the global challenges, the ones that we can only tackle if we coordinate our efforts. These are issues that no country can solve alone, and they're intermingled. The list is long, think about it. Demographics and migration, cyber risks, cyber security slash privacy, and of course, the existential one, which is climate change. On that issue, I know that the Chamber sees great potential in public-private partnerships, as well as innovation and technology to reduce greenhouse gas emission. We at the IMF, we are also deeply engaged on those issues, taking, of course, and exclusively a macroeconomic perspective and focusing our effort and our know-how where we have it. We have in particular focused on pricing carbon emissions and reducing energy subsidies, which currently amount to about 5.2 trillion per year. That is 6.5% of global GDP. Both of these policy tools would go a long way to help mitigate the effects of climate change. This is a matter which is existential for the youngest ones. So when I visit countries around the world where we have programs underway, where we are trying to help, I always see young people. Climate change and the, the impact of climate change on their life and the life of next generations is first and foremost on their list of priorities. The second one, also on their mind, is corruption. This too is an area where the IMF has stepped up its focus on the macroeconomic effects in our member nations. The annual cost of bribery alone, and this is not all corruption, bribery alone, huh, is over $1.5 trillion, roughly 2% of global GDP. Money laundering, the financing of terrorism are other serious dimensions of the problem and we have been working with nearly 100 countries around the world on those issues, trying to help them strengthen their defense against such phenomena. Let me just again mention another piece of research that will be released in the next couple of days. That research underlines the high fiscal cost of corruption, leading to a massive loss in public revenue and lower quality public spending. This new analysis confirms what intuitively we know. Corruption lowers growth. Corruption increases inequality. Corruption feeds distrust. Now, 
some might argue, you will not, you're not going to change this. Well, actually, there is hope in combating corruption. And we think there is, and we do believe that the right policy responses can make a significant difference. In that new study, we estimate that within a group of similar economies, less corruption is associated with higher tax revenues. In fact, a very significant difference of up to four percentage points of GDP between those countries with a lot of it and those countries with less of it in the same category of development. Better governance is also associated with higher student test scores and more efficient spending on vital infrastructure from roads to schools to hospitals. So this highlights the potentially huge benefit of cur curbing corruption. And not only fiscal benefits, but also the potential benefit to society at large. And some countries have actually demonstrated that. There is clearly an international dimension to this. Transparency International, for instance, recently updated its Corruption Perceptions Index, which we'll look at together with many other third-party uh, information. Under this new methodology, 100 means very clean as far as corruption is concerned. By that measure, two-thirds of countries around the world are below 50 indicating that they have serious problems in preventing corruption. Now, certainly countries must accept responsibility for what happens within their own border, but corruption is an international plague, and to fight it effectively requires international cooperation. And I know that the Chamber values cooperation. Ever since World War II, in country after country, in crisis after crisis, working together has served the world well. Yes, the IMF is celebrating its 75, 75th anniversary as NATO is celebrating its 70th anniversary, almost as we speak. But the IMF has been at the center of this coordinated effort when it comes to stability, when it comes to prosperity. During the global financial crisis, the fund the IMF, was able to commit over $500 billion to help prevent that the Great Recession becomes yet another Great Depression. In the decade since, we supported economic programs in over 90 countries. It's all discreet. You don't hear much about it. But the programs are in place trying to help countries face their balance of payment crisis. And our work continues relentlessly every day. It's advice to countries to help them open up their market and encourage investment. It's support for critical country programs in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Jordan, or think about Ukraine or Argentina. And there are a few more expecting. So to do our job effectively, of course, we need to be sufficiently well-resourced into the future. And for that, we rely on the financial support of our 189 country members. And it doesn't cost them anything. It brings them return, actually. So this is another issue that ministers and governors will be debating next week as well. And I'm confident that the support from our membership will remain strong as I'm confident that we will continue to focus on delivering value for the members. So to conclude, I want to return to the inspirational nature of this incredible building, which I hope is strengthened and will be lasting for a long time to come. Inscribed on the walls of the original chamber building was a quote from the great American statesman Daniel Webster. He said, I quote, let us develop the resources of our land, call forth its powers, build up its institutions, promote all its great interests, and see whether we also, in our day and generation, may not perform something worthy to be remembered. At a time when the economy is unsettled, at this delicate moment, let us see if together, we are also able to produce something 
that will be worth being remembered. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage U.S. Chamber President and CEO Tom Donahue and Sarah Eisen from CNBC. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Tom, here. I'm, I'm thrilled to be at the Chamber today interviewing two people whom I've interviewed many, many times, but never together and never in front of a live audience. So this is exciting. And it's about a topic, Madame Lagarde, that you know is front and center for CNBC and top of mind for investors right now, global growth and, and where we are. You, you called it a delicate moment. Mm. And I wonder if you could characterize it even further. I know you don't want to share the numbers yet, but does it mean we're sort of approaching the end of the expansion that's been going on since the financial crisis? No, uh, what we're saying is that the momentum is slowing down. And what I think is really characteristic of this moment is that it is slowing down across the board. You know, we had periods when uh, the emerging market economies would just, you know, propulse uh, many of us. Uh, we had this synchronized acceleration of growth a couple of years ago. Now it's synchronized deceleration and a slowing momentum again, across the, uh, the spectrum. Advanced economies, emerging market economies, low-income countries. Now, I don't want to be overly dramatic because we don't see a recession. We do not see it. Uh, but we believe that because it is so delicate, because it is flawed with, in a way, self-inflicted wounds that only men and women can address, that's why it requires this, you know, handle with care approach that brings together uh, all domestic policies, cross-border and international coordination. We'll get to some of the policies, but first, Tom, what does this kind of economic environment that Madame Lagarde paints mean for your businesses, your members, both U.S. and globally? Well, the U.S. economy, compared to others across the world, um, is uh, doing uh, quite well. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, as you've heard, uh, numbers are moving up and down some. And I would say that we also believe that there won't be a recession. <clears throat> and, uh, but so many of us, so many of our friends uh, in the media, in politics, in business, have predicted 47 of the last four recessions. And, uh, and we have to be very careful, uh, as you said in all of your comments, about what are we going to do to keep the economy going and to continue to stimulate it in a, uh, a sensible way um, to stay above that waterline that we don't want to cross. And I think there are a number of things that uh, we're all interested in doing. Here in the United States, uh, we need uh, we need to look at the fundamental reality that we've run out of people. We need an immigration bill, a thoughtful one. Uh, we have a great opportunity uh, to uh, uh, stimulate our economy in a, in a very constructive way by having a significant in infrastructure bill. But of course, that flies in the face of who's going to do the work. <laughs> Uh, and there are opportunities across this country to, to invest in people and in institutions and, and in communities that will let us move in an aggressive way to keep the numbers up. Now, I do believe, and I've heard Kevin Worsh uh, three times in the last couple of weeks, say some of what I just said, but to say we have to keep our eye on what's going on all around the world mm. and uh, what is causing and what will cause investors and spenders to keep their money in their pockets. Mm. And that's the issue right now that we should all be focusing on. I'm looking forward to your numbers. Ours are pretty much the same. Mm. Uh, but there are great opportunities here to, uh, to advance our own economies and help others. But as you, in your comments, uh, pointed out, what's gonna happen in Brexit? What's gonna happen in Venezuela? 
what's going to happen in uh, the Middle East. And these are issues that are all going to come back to rest on the economy. All the more reason we have to move in an aggressive way to add positive additions to what we're doing. Can I echo what Tom is saying on the, on the, um, the workforce? Because this, this is really a very important issue that matters today, but that will matter even more so uh, in, the, in, in, in the years to come. At the moment, in many countries, the level of unemployment is extraordinarily low. Not all countries. You know, I, there are a few Euro area members where the unemployment rate is still high. But when you start digging into those numbers, most policymakers will actually tell you that this is virtually the structural unemployment that they can't do much about. But what I have heard repeatedly in, in many, many countries around the world is we need the people, but we need the people who are trained for the jobs of today and tomorrow. And I think the issue of uh, training, education, uh, constant training in solid cooperation between uh, educational institutions and the business communities uh, is fundamentally important. If, if that step is missed, uh, then there will be that continued structural unemployment in some countries. And there will not be those uh, trained, skilled uh, employees and workers who will be needed in, in the years to come. Well, you, look, you look at those markets that are so hot when it comes to employment, it's unbelievable. You know, the, the, those kids graduating from artificial intelligence uh, special cycles, they, they go for double, triple the amount that traditional um, graduates would go. And, and you know, this is a, there's a, there's a market. It's a supply and demand uh, issue that really needs to be addressed cooperatively. That's another one. Is that happening here in the U.S.? Are there, are there apprenticeship programs? Are there training programs? Is there cooperation between the private and public sector on this front? Absolutely. Growing very quickly. Companies going into the business far beyond what they had in the past in job training, skills upgrading, um, and by the way, it's because they know that's the right thing to do, but it's because if they don't do it, they don't have workers. Now, there's something more yes. fundamental than that. There are many companies in this country going into the K through 12 education system for adults because uh, we have a real problem in terms of the fundamentals of reading, writing, and, uh, and a little more than adding and subtracting, but arithmetic. Mm. And it's, uh, it's a, uh, an issue that governments for years have taken up on a local and a federal level, but we're falling behind. And if you look at uh, who can read and who can't read uh, uh, realities, uh, that's a weakness that we have to deal with. On the other hand, it has been amazing as the, as the uh, unemployment uh, dropped and the, the, the level of what workers are now uh, being paid and, and the training that's available, people that haven't had that benefit are going and saying, okay, help me. Mm -hmm. Because the jobs are there, the opportunities are there. So that's one policy prescription. Obviously trade, you highlight as a major risk to the global yes. economy, something that you say is a self-made problem. You've called for multilateralism. You've called for integration. Do you see appetite right now for, for that? And you know, what could go right on this front? There are deals mm -hmm. that are being discussed. Well, I, yes, uh, I think there is appetite for that. Uh, when I look around the world, um, when I see, for instance, that the um, uh, CTPP which brings together 11 countries um, in, you know, under the leadership of Japan, now that the United States has, you know, in its time, pulled out of that effort. Uh, coming together, I think seven of the 11th have now ratified, so it is, it is being implemented uh, as, a, as a very innovative new um, plurilateral agreement. You know, it's, it's not bilateral, it's not multilateral, it's plurilateral. When I see the, the African uh, Union, um, regional trade agreement, which also has also been uh, uh, acted upon and which South Africa has just recently joined, where Nigeria is considering and, and would join as well. I'm not suggesting that it's going to boost instantly 
uh, trade between countries because there are lots of infrastructure hurdles and there are lots of uh, barriers that need to be removed. But it certainly uh, indicates that there is that appetite between EU and Japan, same thing, moving forward at a pace that we would not have su suspected. And clearly what has happened between Canada, the United States and Mexico is also an indication that um, there is an appetite for, uh, for plurilateral trade. So I think people recognize the value of it, but where we are at the moment is that uncertain position where we don't really know what's going to give, uh, whether all players will be on the same uh, level playing field um, domain where they can compete fairly with each other uh, and where it's going to be mutually um, beneficial to all and where there is that trepidation and anxiety and people wonder how will my supply chain be distorted, disturbed? Uh, where will I be able to open further uh, activity in such markets? Will services be included? When you look at you know, goods, fine, barriers are relatively low at the moment. When you look at services, uh, there is an incredible set of barriers to entry between countries, which would really unleash potential for growth if it was uh, removed and removed in, in a fair and mutually beneficial way. I mean, this administration has used tariffs as a tool for trying to get better trade deals, fairer terms for U.S. companies. How much, how much are the trade tariffs that, I mean, Madame Lagarde gave some pretty stark numbers today about the hit to economic growth we could see, but how much are the tariffs impacting U.S. business right now? Well, first of all, and I don't, I don't believe that people across this country really understand this, when we put tariffs on another country's trade relationship with us, we pay them. Right? American. They don't pay American. them. America. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. if the French put tariffs Well, that's because on, the president says that the Chinese pay them. Uh, I'll leave you to comment on that. <laughs> uh, I, uh, he comments on it. I want to make two points. First of all, I think it's important to go back because why are, why are we so interested in trade? You know, we have 330 million people, let's say. The Chinese have a billion 331 million people. And, and we want to sell to those people. If we decide that we're going to block ourselves off and only sell domestically, we're going to become an insignificant country. The second thing, which is very important, we want to buy products. I mean, you go to the households uh, all over this country and say, well, what products do you buy? How do you get the best for your household income? And people want to get those issues. Now, I agree with the administration that, that there were things that needed to be fixed. There's no question about, and we all know, and uh, I'll be there in a couple of weeks, dealing with China is a challenge because they're dealing, Chinese have a challenge in dealing with modernizing of their economy. And uh, there's no question about the protection of intellectual property is necessary and that we have to do things to stop any joint venture that requires us to cough up all our technology. And of course, in China, they've decided what are going to be their industries and others can't join that. Well, we just have to explain it to them and we're explaining it. So do I think it's uh, uh, that the president and the administration were wrong to get strong with them? No, I think it was the right thing to do for the long term. Look. There is no argument that you can make that tariffs are going to do that job alone or over any long period of time without screwing up the economy. Yeah. All right? So we have tried to say, OK, you've used those. You got their attention. You've got a great trade negotiating team. When we get to the right place, get rid of those. When we did NAFTA, and we had, we had to do that, by the way. You remember that when we negotiated NAFTA, there wasn't even an internet in the world, That's you true. know, except the ones the military owned. And now we're down that, you know, the trade facilitation agreement 
and all of this technology, we needed to make some changes. And the administration has said again and again, when we get that done, then we're going to get rid of these, uh, these tariffs. Well, let's hurry up. And by the way, let's hurry up and get it through the Congress. So look, trade is what people argue about when they've got difficulties in their own economy. Because if you need somebody to blame about what the administration is doing, or previous administrations were doing, then you blame trade because they don't vote in your, you know, your country. <laughs> and you tell everybody that we're going to solve everybody's problems by being tough with those folks, except sometimes the price of products go up and the ability to sell things around the world go down, and that doesn't really work. And we have got to get back in that Pacific Agreement for the fundamental reason that the geopolitical implications far outreach the trade implications, but will have an effect on it. Yes, absolutely. I'm opinionated and, about and this. You, and Tom, these, these things actually change over the course of time, because we're both old enough to rem remember the days when Japan was regarded as a major threat, uh, somebody who copied everything right. and took... I remember days when they were you know, walking the streets of Paris, taking photos of shop windows to replicate what they were seeing in, in, in there. And they couldn't, they, they really did not pay much attention to intellectual property. If you look now at the intellectual property efforts around the world, the Association of Intellectual Property Lawyers, all these, these instances, oh, Japan is at the top of those groups. And they're very, very keen to protect IP. This, this, is, this is going to, this is happening actually. How did that China. happen? Because we, because we brought them in? But no, but because, oh. well, I, I think it happened because it became in their interest. Because as, as they you know, find, put more money into research and development, filed more patents, had more brands as well, they started seeing the value of IP as an asset and in need of protection and enforcement. You know, you don't care about intellectual property if you don't have something you want to protect. After you get to the point where you've got valuable uh, brands and commodities and technology, then you want to move very aggressively so that people don't take yours. And it's pretty cycling. So it sounds like you're both fairly optimistic that, that there will be a deal and it will be, Madame Lagarde, of substance addressing some of these key structural issues. You want to go no, first I'm not, on I'm not, in, I'm not in the heart of the team of negotiators and, and everything that we read from hearsay, you know, secondary, indirect uh, feedback seems reasonably positive, but you know, a deal is a deal when it's signed, sealed, and delivered, and when the fat lady has sung. So <laughs> let's, let's, let's wait. So on behalf of the fat lady, yeah. we're gonna try and get the music together in a big hurry. Are you involved in these negotiations? The chamber has been at every one of the negotiations on NAFTA and I would say we've been also there during every one of the negotiations with China, and uh, we've been all over on the big challenges we have in India. We have, we have a cadre of very, very smart people in a very large group of people running our international business and our trade business, and we're very proud of them, and we are keeping the heat where the heat belongs. I'll go back to your, your comment, which actually you made 18 months ago when we were together at Harvard and you brought up again today, fix the roof while the sun is shining. You, last time we spoke, you were at the business roundtable. You're here at the Chamber of Commerce. Clearly, you're very engaged at, at the IMF with businesses. What else can Tom's members and his organization do in terms of policy steps to preserve the expansion? You know, when I look at the, uh, the, the drivers for growth, um, I clearly see investment as lagging behind in some sectors, including in this country. Um, that's number one. Number two, you know, when you see the, the threat of climate change and a few others around, uh, investing in those um, activities, in those businesses that are going to move the needle and take us to, you know, more productive, more sustainable um, growth and businesses is also going to be you know, promoted and delivered by the private sector. 
I'm not one of those who believe that the public sector is going to actually implement it. It will be for the private sector to do that, and it's critically important. Is that happening? Yeah, if you heard JJ's opening um, comments and pointed out that today we have half the public companies we did not very long ago, and there's been a lot of uh, investors that don't want to go public if they can avoid it because of the extraordinary uh, attacks and criticism of and regulatory uh, in pressure put on public companies. Uh, and I believe, uh, and we are very aggressive on going after these attacks, I believe that uh, what we have to do as government and the private sector and the legal community, we have to be very, very careful uh, that we don't kill the goose that lays the golden eggs, and we've been pretty busy on it. Although I would sort of predict that you'll see a lot of movement in the right direction on that pretty what soon. What about investment? There was supposed to be this big investment boom after the administration's trillion and a half dollar tax cut, which primarily lowered the corporate tax rate. What's happened to that? The lower, you lowered the corporate tax rate and uh, you found the lowest unemployment in the last 65 years in this country. You found an extraordinary uh, uh, progress in, in companies investing, by the way, and also uh, providing benefits for their investors. Because when the government and everybody says, well, they got some of that money back and they gave it to their investors. Can you imagine doing that? Buybacks? What do you think? Well, some buybacks and other people had other ways to do that. And the investment in new technologies and new um, steps going forward. If you don't grow, if you don't change, if you don't invent, you go backwards. And you know, we could all look at the tax deal Remember, it's always fun to talk about taxes all the way back to the time of Christ. And, and <laughs> well, read the Bible. And, uh, and I'll tell you that we spent a good 12 years with under 2% economic growth in this country that put us in a big hole. The tax bill, whether you like it or you didn't like it, changed the mentality here, and people started to move. Economic growth, more employment, a better look to the future. And now if we fix the trade deal, I think you might say then the tax deal was even better. Because it's not the tax deal that's the, the weight on this economy. It's the way we're in the process of fixing the trade deal. We got to get the process done with and get going because no buying, no selling, no growth. That was going to be my question to you, Tom, actually. Do, do you think that if the trade landscape is certain, settled, agreed upon, with no more uh, trepidations and anxiety, do you think that the corporate sector, which has benefited from this, this um, tax bill uh, earlier on, will actually move to more investment than it has so far? But Because yes, you're right, unemployment is at uh, rock bottom. Wages have begun to uh, shift up. And, uh, and there has been some added, added investment, but there's been a lot of um, share buyback uh, programs, a lot of legitimate you know, uh, uh, compensation for investors who have trusted uh, the enterprises. But do you think there will be more in terms of investment? Yes, but I think we have to look just for a minute about a fundamental reality. If you pick the last, I don't know, six, seven, eight weeks, mm -hmm. Uh, it's my view without a lot of pr proof, but you know, talking to Kevin and, and economists mm -hmm. here and people, that all of a sudden a lot of people that have been putting money in and out of markets and investing in new technology and they've sort of, they're holding on to their cash. Mm -hmm. They want to know what's going to happen to Brexit. They want to know what's going to happen in Venezuela. And remember, when you look at these issues, they're not about one country. True. You look about Venezuela, you've got, it's connected to Colombia by a bridge, and there's more, more than a million Venezuelans living there. You've got 20,000 plus of hard 
knows Cuban troops in Venezuela. You've got the, the, the Russians who have got um, $25 billion invested down there and, want to, and are now starting to stash their planes there. And you've got the Chinese with uh, 50 plus billion invested there. And when you go all around the world and look at these complex things, they're much more complex than you think, and investors are chicken. When, they're, when things are unstable that they're looking at and they're wondering what's going to happen next week, which also means what our, what's going on in our world on trade, they say, well, I think I'll do that next week. <laughs> I'll do that next month. Why don't we look at it at the next board meeting? How many times, you've been on a lot of those boards, and I have, how many times you hear in a board meeting, well, the, the board says to the CEO, boy, that's a great idea. Why don't we look at it at the next board meeting when we're a little more sure of the market? There's always going to be uncertainty, though. Well, that's, if you don't have uncertainty, you remember what happened in all the big banks during that time of very low uh, interest rates and very low growth? All of the, all where they used to make tons of money on trading, they couldn't make any money because there was no movement. And that's why they shifted a lot of their investment. Uh, now we're back to trading. I mean, look at the, by the way, I don't think that the market is an articulation of the health of the economy. It's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a recognition that there are people in this country and around the world that are willing to take a risk on the strength of this economy. Do you think the market, we'll, we'll, we'll end with that comment from you, Matt, Madam Lagarde. The market is actually now a few percentage points away from a record high if you look at the US stock market. Is that a reflection of what's going on? I think it's a reflection of the, the financial conditions which have clearly eased and which are still quite uh, favorable and supportive. Um, we've, we, you know, we've, seen, we've seen it in the last few months um, from a malaise that was clearly uh, also visible at the end of 2018. So uh, I think the financial circumstances and conditions and, and terms that are available are clearly uh, encouraging that. But I would agree that it does not reflect necessarily the fundamentals of the economy. Thank you both. And I'll end with a tease and a shameless plug that you can hear more of these esteemed speakers on these topics on CNBC in the next few hours. They'll be speaking with me both. Thank you so much, Thank Tom you. Donahue Thank and you. Christine Lagarde. <laughs>